Big Mike here with He's Entertainment. Today's episode, we got Canadian sports broadcaster James Duffy from TSN. If you like what we're doing, you hit the subscribe button. Hey guys, it's James Duffy from TSN, and I'm coming up on I Only Touch Greatness podcast. If you're looking for a mug, perhaps a hoodie, head on over to IOnlyTouchGreatness.com. This is the hottest place, 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 the big, big, big name interviews in Vancouver with Ryan Hayes and Big, Big Mike. Good. So I got Ryan and who else? Big, big Mike. Mike. Big Mike. I'm, I'm Ryan. Good, guys. Uh, sorry this took so long. Hey, no worries. I mean, you're busy. You're, you're a rock star in Canada, you know? Oh, hardly. <laughs> thank you very much uh, for taking the time for us today we really appreciate it uh no problem man thanks for uh thanks for having me boys hey, no worries how was augusta so uh weird augusta was weird but selfishly it was like the best for watching golf ever like i will never ever be able to go back i will go back but with crowds <laughs> To be able to walk that golf course and have nobody else there, because I've said this before, but that's a really tough tournament to cover um, on the golf course because you can't bring your cell phone. There's no electronic scoreboards and, you know, we're not allowed inside the ropes. So you're 30, you know, you see the tip of Tiger's cap or something. That's about it. Right. So to be able to stand, you know, 10 feet away from Tiger or DJ on every single tee shot, be basically the, like we followed one of my producers and I, Puffy, uh, followed Tiger for nine holes on Friday, I guess. And his gallery was his girlfriend, uh, his agent, Peyton Manning, and Puffy and I. That was the gallery. <laughs> so, oh. so it was very cool, that part of it. Uh, like I was there on three on Friday when Bryson DeChambeau self-destructed there and was basically alone just listening to the golfers uh, talk about it and watch it. So... That part of it was really cool. Uh, so sort of a once in a lifetime to, to see it really up close like that. But, uh, you know, you did miss the fans and everything. It wasn't the same, right? I'm sure it wasn't the same on TV. No, it wasn't. You know, me and you have been pretty close to almost meeting one time here. They, they were, it was a World Junior game in Vancouver. And the recent one or the 06 one? No, the last one that was just here two years ago. It was like a Swiss game in the morning, and it was you and Bob McKenzie, and all of a sudden this Don Cherry guy showed up standing behind you. <laughs> I was the Don Cherry guy. <laughs> I uh, Was that where were we? Were we on our set? Yeah, you were on yes. your set up there, and I, I, yeah. bought the t I bought the two seats that were directly behind you guys just so <laughs> actually, I could. I, I actually remember that. Now, I will say this. Like most people who tell me they met me at a World Juniors or something – you know, unfortunately, you meet 8 million people, but uh, the Don Sherry outfit, I can pretty much remember. And you were kind of there the whole game, right? Yeah, I was there for that game. And then also the Canada-US game. It was New Year's Eve, I believe. Nice. Yeah. I'll so say this. I'm not, I'm not sucking up to you guys because you're in Vancouver. But uh, that was so disappointing when Canada lost. Not that I'm a homer, but just for the sake of the World Juniors, obviously, it's much better for us, the 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 bubble kind of burst when Canada gets eliminated in a world juniors in Canada. And I would say that that if they'd have gone on to the finals or something, I think that had the potential to be like, you know, one of, if not the, the best world juniors because the crowds were so awesome. And uh, I don't know. I just, I love Vancouver. Obviously I lived out there and I love it. And I just, that, that was one of the, probably the most disappointing end to a world junior uh, bar none for me. Uh, now I'm selfish because of TSN, but just because it was going so great. Yeah. And, and I was, you know, the folks in van had been just awesome. I think it was, so was that two years ago? Yeah, two years two ago. Years. And I, had, I did 28 game packs. So to see them go out, I believe it was the quarters. And then you still had yeah, to go it was to the quarters. And you still had to go to the silver and gold medal games. And yeah. uh, I mean, it was good to see Quinn Hughes go to the gold medal game, but. Right. I loved hearing the whole city chant Di Pietro's name at the end of the yeah. game. Yeah, and the other thing is, we just went through those three years of Toronto, Montreal, Montreal, Toronto, and Buffalo, 
which I, I think that was a mistake they made. Like to have three sort of in the Southern Ontario area and two in Montreal in a three year span. It was just too much, right? And so I'm a big believer that the world juniors should come to your area like once a decade. Like Vancouver was perfect, right? It was there in 06, yeah. time goes by, uh, comes back a couple of years ago and that gives you enough time to get super pumped about it again. And uh, so, yeah, I was just, that was a great world juniors that just had a, a sour ending for Canada. Absolutely. Yeah. World juniors has always been my favorite hockey. I mean, those kids just give it them all, give it their all. And it's the funnest hockey to watch. I got to say, you guys got better. I'm supposed to be on television. You guys got better backdrops in your studios than I do by far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me, I got like some crappy piece of art and some of my books behind me. And that's about, that's about it. Oh yeah. We'll get, we'll get into your books. You got four of them now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Four. Yeah. Okay. Um, so born in Ottawa, uh, what was the life? Uh, what was it like growing up there? Well, I kind of had nomadic life early because my dad was RCMP. So my dad's out from, from, he's a BC boy who grew up in Kamloops and uh, I was born in Ottawa, but I only lived there for six weeks and my dad got transferred to Edmonton, lived in Edmonton for a year. Uh, that's where my love of hockey, I think, was born. I was a baby, but we lived next to a guy named uh, Cliff Coral's family. Cliff Coral played with Stan Makita on the Blackhawks in the 70s. So that was my first favorite hockey player. And uh, that's um, Blackhawks were my first favorite team. And uh, uh, only because my dad would always tell me, yeah, we used to live next to Cliff Coral's family. And then we moved to Halifax. Then we moved to Victoria. Uh, for three years that and then I moved back to Ottawa I think by the time I was 10 but it was good it was a good life I mean uh, normal suburban uh, boy son of a cop and a teacher and played lots of sports and went and suffered watching the Ottawa Rough Riders obviously we didn't have an NHL team but uh, watched the Ottawa 67s uh, which was cool when I got into the business the first team I covered was kind of the 67s and Brian Kilray who had grown up watching so that was that was kind of neat circle of life. Yeah, because, okay, well, we'll skip a few questions here on that one. But one of your books, They Call Me Killer, that one was about Kilray, right? Look at you just spinning the interview right there. That's a good interviewer right there. I know, I had to <laughs> skip like 10 questions, but we'll circle back to them. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, that was the first book I did. Um, and I always just thought that Killer was maybe not nearly as well known out West with you guys, but... In Ontario, the OHL, a real legend. And I've always thought that he was as big a character, you know, as Don Sherry, but without the, you know, he didn't have the Saturday night pulpit, right? Like that he was, he had just as good stories, was perhaps a bigger actual character as a coach than, than Grapes was. And uh, so when someone had written a, a crappy little book about him basically early, I think, I shouldn't say that, I never read it, but. Uh, no one had really written a real book. And so I thought that would be the perfect first book was to tell his story. And uh, he just had a, you know, he had a million stories to tell as did the players who, who played for him. So that wasn't a real me writing the book. I, uh, that was him telling me all the stories and, and me writing it in his own words, but it was a good baptism into the, the world of literature. <laughs> did you always want to be in sports broadcasting? And how did it all get started? I think that, uh, like a lot of guys, I was a kind of a failed athlete. Uh, I can remember being, I don't know how young I would have been. You guys have probably done this, right? Have you, at some point in your life, did you turn down the TV and do your own play by play? Will you admit to it? Well, I, actually, the All Star game was in Vancouver, I believe, 96, and they had that little setup where you could choose a highlight and you could do your own play by play to it. And of course, I did the Pavel Bure goal, but. <laughs> but tell me when you're like 14 or 15 alone in the house, you didn't try it at some point, right? I, I used to do that all the time with NFL games. Oh, and, yeah. Can uh, he go all the way? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So uh, uh, I, I did that a lot. And I guess that's where probably maybe it was planted somewhere in the back of my mind, although I didn't really think about being a broadcaster. I was going to be a, I was going to be I wanted to be a gym teacher. And uh, I was a football player in high school. And flag was, was going to go to McGill and uh, sorry, you're a flag flag football superstar. <laughs> Don't listen to Ferraro, okay? <laughs> uh, that back then, uh, back I was did become a pathetic 
flag football player, but uh, <laughs> but I played normal football in high school, and I was going to go to McGill and play football. That was the only school that really recruited me, and uh, I was going to take phys ed and be a gym teacher, and then I kind of decided at the last second I had this oh, epiphany that uh, I wanted to do something more, and uh, uh, so I ended up taking journalism with the hopes of being a sports broadcaster someday. So, yeah, I guess it was – I guess it was always at the back of my mind as soon as I realized I wasn't going to make it as a professional athlete, which was fairly early, somewhere near the end of high school. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess I did. I I didn't think big though. I think I wrote this in my in my last book, uh, the guy on the left. I like I didn't have like huge ambitions or anything. I remember you know growing up in Ottawa, I would watch the local news back when the local news was a thing. Nobody watches the local news anymore for their sports, but. Um, you know, I guess sports page would have been big for you guys when you were kids, but, uh, Don Taylor. Yeah, exactly. So I, you know, the local sportscaster in Ottawa was a guy named Brian Smith. And I said, man, if I could ever, you know, work there and just do the local late night news sports or whatever, that would be, that was my career goal, career goal. I never thought about, you know, doing world juniors and, and, uh, masters and things like that. So I guess I wasn't very ambitious at the beginning. Um, you Who won, go ahead, Mike. I was just going to say, who influenced you uh, to get to where you are today? That's a great question. Do you mean like some on-air people or? Uh... Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I always say like, I think the my biggest influence wasn't a sports broadcaster. It was probably David Letterman. When I was in high school, that's when Letterman was young. I'm pretty old. And so... I used to watch Letterman when he had an afternoon show before he had the night show. And I don't know, just the way, the way he used humor and this casual way he interviewed people. I, I, I think I, he probably inspired me more than anybody else. You know, I certainly guys like, you know, Bob Costas, who back in the day Costas would do was the host of the NFL show on the weekend. And obviously the Dave's Dave Hodges and such on, on hockey night in Canada. Um, but I think guys like that probably, uh, you know, there was, I didn't have one idol. I don't think in broadcasting by any means, but, uh, I mean, Letterman was my idol. I didn't have an idol in sports broadcasting, but certainly, you know, a, a guy like, uh, Costas, I thought was really good. And I'm going to blank on a whole bunch of other names probably that, uh, uh, but there was, there was no one person. I just thought, man, that would be really cool to get to go to see games for free, basically. How about Howie Meeker? <laughs> yeah, you know, Howie, uh, for sure, was, uh, was, was a legend. And that was my era of growing up. It was Howie Meeker in one intermission and Peter Puck, I yeah. think, in the other intermission a lot of the time. And I remember I played, uh, when I was playing hockey in Ottawa, uh, Howie Meeker's brother, Tommy Meeker, uh, came out to be a special coach at our practice one time. I guess he knew one of our coaches. And that was a big deal. Like that was my first celebrity I ever met was Howie Meeker's brother. And uh, he came out and was our, uh, I got his autograph and that was my first brush with fame. Was that, that's, about, that's a typical Canadian brush with fame. Howie Meeker's brother, my first <laughs> autograph. <laughs> um, so you've What's won the- many awards in broadcasting. Does one of them stand out more than the other? Uh Yeah, you know, actually, I would say the one that stands out, uh, we won an award for um, a documentary that we did on uh, uh, Jonathan Pitcher, the butterfly child. I don't know if you guys know Jonathan's story, Um, but that one probably meant more to me than anything else, just because, okay, it's nice to be recognized for, for what we do on trade deadline or free agent frenzy or the masters or the world juniors or whatever it may be. But that was a really cool night. Jonathan came to the awards. It was one of those Canadian screen awards or Gemini's or whatever they were called at the time and, uh, and got to come up on stage and I got to present him with the award. And here's a kid that went through like the most painful life anyone could imagine. He passed away two and a half years ago, but uh, for him to have that moment, you know, up there on the stage with a big award, giving a speech, uh, crowd gave him a standing ovation. That's probably the one that, uh, that's probably the one I'm most proud of. Okay. That's great. 
sure. Um, if you weren't a professional broadcaster, what would you be doing? Probably be a gym teacher. <laughs> that was the backup. Uh, we were talking, I was talking about my kids today because they never knew that story. And they were asking me about that uh, because my daughter's trying to decide what she's going to take in university. And so they were going, I think you would have been a, made a better gym teacher, dad, than you would have been a TV guy. I'm not sure what that says about my TV, my kids, the way my kids think about my TV abilities. But uh, um, yeah, I, uh, I wanted to be a gym teacher or I guess my fallback was to join the RCMP like my dad. I think he kind of wanted that in the back of his heart. Maybe he was very supportive of me, but uh, you know, I think he kind of wanted me to follow in his footsteps. So I always thought if I, not that the RCMP is like a fallback, but, but if I didn't succeed in sports casting, I probably would have tried to join the RCMP. Okay. But I, I'll say this and I'm not like being uh, self-deprecating. I have like very few skills. <laughs> and so <laughs> I don't know what I'd be doing if I didn't find, I kind of lucked into something that I really liked and that I was okay at because I'm useless at almost everything else. Right on cue yeah, on that right. one. Hang on, Mike, right on cue, right on, cue on that one. Uh, when we interviewed Grant Fuhrer last night, he, one of Mike's questions was, what is your most useless talent? So what would your most useless talent be? My most useless talent. I mean, I can do West Side with my toes. <laughs> uh, I used to be able to. Uh, you ever flip quarters off your uh, off your elbow? I no. Stack up quarters. <laughs> it used to be like a, a drinking game. Okay. And I think that it was in you know when I was a kid, like I was fourteen or fifteen. It was in the Guinness Book of World Records. Somebody done like one hundred and twenty quarters or something. So this is what we used to do on. Like when we were just having basement house parties in high school on Friday nights, we'd stack up quarters or pennies and you just basically stack them on your arm like this. And I was the freaking Gloucester High School champion of that. Like I was <laughs> unbelievable. For, and I don't even have big hands, right? I kind of have smallish hands, but I could do like 70 quarters or 70 pennies. Of so that was my useless talent. <laughs> Only other thing I'm good at. What's your uh, favorite retro jersey with all those ones being dropped? So uh, I, uh, I'll give you a little hint. I got, you know, sometimes the benefits of the job. I got an email from the Adidas people uh, saying we could have one. And so I had to pick. But I'm going to give it to my son who, uh, who's cho who just actually texted me right before I got on the podcast and said he's decided on the St. Louis Blues. Um, cause he's, he's sort of a leaf sense guy. Believe it or not, they exist. He likes the leaf and the sense. Um, but I said, just pick the, pick a cool Jersey, right? Because the Leafs and the sense ones are kind of boring. Uh, I would say I really like the Minnesota wild one, yeah. which is, I don't think, I don't know if that's gotten a lot of love or not. I'm not a real Jersey guy, so I haven't really followed this as much as, uh, uh as probably everybody else has, but I like the the Kings one's really cool. I think everybody liked Colorado. I didn't like it as much. I like I the like New Jersey New, one. Jer and exactly, and that's the probably you know New Jersey, the least talked about team in the league, basically, right? And I never thought about their jerseys ever as nice. And that was the other one my son liked too. Who's so I would say Jersey, Minnesota. I really liked, and um, the Canucks one was just okay. I thought the Canadian ones were all just kind of. The Habs one looked pretty good. Chicago was the other one I liked, but I'm kind of, again, I get kind of a, the, the, the Hawks white jersey, the old white jersey. I get a visceral reaction to that jersey because that's the first team I ever loved. So, you know, t I, you know, when you're seven years old and you love a team and you see that jersey and you just get those feelings. So I've always loved the Hawks jersey. So I like the Hawks one as well. But those would flame. be my those would be my favorites. The, the, the flames stole our the flame yeah the flames stole it, steal our players and now they steal our jersey too. It I know pretty much right. Yeah. They, but the flames well, the because I, I hadn't even seen all the jerseys till Jay and Dan had it on their they broke down their thing a couple right. nights ago. Right. Um. But they that color. I like that Canucks jersey though. Like the Canucks jersey that you have the the Besser and Pedersen one. Yeah. That's one of my like that color combo is one of my favorite jerseys yeah. in the league. It definitely yeah. is. It's a beauty. The I, I, the Calgary Flames one though that that's the same logo they used already. That I know, they had I know. Ten years ago, I got to say I'll probably offend the folks in Calgary, but that's probably one of my my least favorite of the ones. Oh yeah, 
Yeah, I didn't <laughs> like that one. I didn't like Anaheim, although my son is 21, like the, An- the Anaheim one. I didn't well, that's that, that exploding great. duck. It's almost like duck. Yeah, I, I know. I, I get the whole thing, but I just I don't, I thought it was whatever. No, I didn't, I, like I, I, didn't lo- I didn't love the Calgary one. No, they need to go back to the one from the movie, the original Mighty Ducks logo. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so uh, your, other, your, yeah, your other book, uh, The Day I Almost Killed the Two Gretzkys, can you tell us a little about that? So uh, that was kind of a lazy man's book. Um, back when I started it, when the interweb first caught on, uh, TSN was looking for stuff to put on their website. This is how old I am. They basically just started their website and they were looking for material. And so they asked me if I wanted to write. So I started writing a weekly column. And then I started writing for a couple of the papers in Canada. And so I had this collection of columns that I'd done over eight years or something like that. And I thought maybe I could stick them all in a book. They were all about different things, about hockey, about my family, about golf. Um, and so right around the time I was writing the Kill Ray book, the same publisher said, sure, we'll publish a book of your columns. So uh, so that's what the day I almost killed two Gretzky's. Now, it's, uh, for those who don't know or haven't read it, um, the title comes from one of the chapters of the book where I was basically playing golf. Uh, in a Wayne Gretzky had a professional tournament actually up in uh, up in Ontario, and I was playing uh, the first. I almost killed Wayne and Walter in a three hole span. Um, mm. I'll just give you a quick version of the chapter. So I was playing with Walter in a group. It was G- Walter and Gino Retta and I and somebody else, and we were playing behind Wayne and three of his friends. Walter is like the greatest guy in the world, the worst guy to play golf with, because back then, anyway, all he did was look for golf balls the entire round. All he did was walk around looking for golf balls, which is the craziest thing for a guy whose son is worth whatever hundreds of millions of dollars, yeah. <laughs> you know, to find some old beat up match fly. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so we spent the whole round going, where's Walter? Where's Walter? And we were on this, uh, this hole, which kind of had a slightly elevated tee box with all this fescue right in front of it. And literally in my backswing, Walter's head popped out of the out of the field like a fox in the meadow, like right in front of me. And I kind of stopped my stopped my swing. <laughs> now, you know, what are the chances that I would have uh, smacked Walter in the head twenty yards away from me? Well, if I hit a worm burner, which I've known to be, do before, that was possible. Then a few holes later. Um, it was a par five and Wayne's group was up on the green and I was in the middle of fairway, but I had a long way, like two sixty to the green or something uphill. And I'm saying, should I go? And Gino Reda says to me, yeah, I just go. You're, you're not going to make it to the green. Like I'm an okay golfer, but not amazing. And, but I hit an awesome shot. So I, I stroked this three wood and like here, are the thought processes in my head were like, Oh man, I just destroyed that. And my next thought was, that's good. That's going to make it on the green. And the next thought was, that's actually going for that guy in the red shirt at the edge of the green. And my next thought was, holy crap, that's Gretz. <laughs> and, my, and my next thought was, that's not just going at him. It's going to hit him like right in that part of the brain that yeah. you know kills you, in, kills you instantly. <laughs> and then my last thought was, uh, how fast can I get to Mexico? Yeah, you probably <laughs> so, would have got banished from the country. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, what was a um, typical break in my golfing life, but probably the best break of my life, the ball plugged in the top of the bunker right below his foot. And uh, it must have made a sound because he turned around, at which point I just pointed at Gino. <laughs> it's pretty, and, cool, uh, pretty, cool, pretty cool that he, yeah. said, uh, he said I was lucky enough to uh, obviously survive the day with Duffy playing my golf tournament. Little did I know he'd turn that experience into one of the best books of sports that I've read in a long time. It's pretty impressive yeah, that there. Was, that, that was very nice of him. And Wayne actually, uh, there was a chapter in the new book uh, about Gretz, which was really cool because one, when I started writing Beauties, uh, which is just a collection of great hockey stories uh, to preempt, a, I'm sure, a question that's coming. Yeah, it but, is. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, wa- I obviously wanted to get all as many big names as I could in the book, right? You want Gretzky and, and uh, Bobby Orr and Crosby and McDavid and guys like this. And uh, I, I was worried that I couldn't get a – I wanted the stories to be all new that people hadn't heard before. That was one of the keys to my book is it's called Hockey's Greatest Untold Stories. I, 
I didn't want anything that had been written in eight other books. And so with Gretz, I'm thinking, how am I going to find a book that's not in a Gretzky book? Because there's been a million books written about Gretzky. So I called him. I said, do you think you have any stories that haven't been in any of your books? And sure enough, he called me the next day and he said, I got one for you. And uh, that ended up being sort of the genesis. There's a few stories in the, in the chapter on Gretzky, but, uh, um, but he was able to find a, a pretty cool story for me. And he actually ends up in another story. I'll give this one away. Uh, I wanted the book to have not just hockey players, but all aspects of hockey, like coaches, some fans, some parents, referees, agents. So there's stories in there from everyone. And Bill McCreary, the Hall of Fame referee, tells a story about, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, if you've, if you've had a chance to read my book yet, but uh, you can Google, Google McCreary hits Gretzky. And uh, a guy named Bill McCreary, who was the, the Bill McCreary, the ref's cousin, hit Wayne in a game, a Leafs Oilers game way back when. And Gretz pretty much says it's the hardest hit he's ever taken in his life. And it's right there on YouTube. And that Bill McCreary was playing his, maybe his, I don't know, his second NHL game. And he only played a handful more and he was out of the league and never played again. So a year later, Bill McCreary, the referee breaks into the league (laughs) and the Oilers, a lot of the Oilers thought that he was the one who'd hit Gretzky, that he'd like given up hockey and become a ref. So his first few games ref in the Oilers, they were just all over him, every single chef. Now Wayne knew and Glenn Sather knew, but I don't think either one of them let on because they wanted, you know, they enjoyed the, giving it to this young referee. So that's another one of my sort of favorite stories in the book is this poor Bill McCurry having to skate around the ice going, it wasn't me, guys, it wasn't me. <laughs> I can't Actually, wait to read that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that one, that book sounds awesome. I heard you when you were on 1040 radio a couple weeks back and you were telling about your book. I think it was with Donnie and the Moj. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, think you all- you, I think you guys will like it. It's just, you know what, like, like if you had, you know, who, who's your favorite all-time Canuck? All-time Canuck? Pavel Burr. Pavel. Yeah, so, you know, if you two, if it was the three of us and Pavel in a bar, Right, having a couple of beers. I'd be asking him about oh. Metier. Yeah, you'd be asking him. That's what when 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 all of us, I think, as Canadians, when we get if you ever get a moment with a hockey player like that, you always just want to know the stories, right? What was this guy like? What was this guy like? And and I'd never seen a book like that. There's a lot of biographies about hockey players that have some good stories in them, but I'd never seen a book that was just good stories. And so basically, I just asked these 60 guys, tell me your favorite, your best hockey story. Like if, if we were sitting in a bar, tell me your best story that you feel comfortable repeating in a book. And so that's what basically it is. And, uh, um, you know, it, it was a lot of fun listening to the stories and gathering them and putting them together. Mike, who is the Christmas tree story? Christmas tree? Oh, yeah. Remember, they came down the elevator with the Christmas tree, and then the coach was standing there. Scotty, not wasn't Scotty Bowen, but think about that one. You, you, <laughs> but that's you know, what that's the kind of that's the kind of stuff that's in the book. Wherever you're going, there is yeah, that's the kind of stuff we, I think you'll we find. can't remember. It might have been Rob Ray. Yeah, I think it was Rob Ray. Actually. Rob Ray told us the story. He was in the hotel, and him and somebody took down the tree, and then the the Christmas tree that was in the hotel lobby took it back to their room. And then the coach, Muckler, I think at the time. I think it was Muckler. Yeah. Get down here with the tree. And he came down there and it was in pieces and he just dropped it to him and went back to his room. (laughs) Well, that's, uh, I mean, that's basically what Beauties is, is a a collection. Now, there are some serious stories in there and there are some on the ice stories, but that is a wide variety of stories like that. Um, And we have a podcast out too, which tells some of them. Uh, You know, Brett Hall uh, is such a character and Kelly Chase tells told me an hour and a half worth of Brett Hall stories which were <laughs> kind of like that uh yeah if you if you listen to the pod or or buy the book you'll love it but the, one of them is the first night he met Bobby Hall who was you know there's a Kelly, that was that was kind of his idol so Bobby comes into town to watch a game and Kelly and Brett are rooming together and uh I had heard rumors of this before but I never heard it confirmed in a story but they're going up on the elevator after the game to go back to the room because Bobby was going to stay in their room. There was no other rooms in the hotel, the Drake in Chicago. And Bobby, uh, there's an elevator man back in that day, kind of a fancy hotel. And Bobby says, uh, 
let me out on one, please. And Brett's like, Dad, what are you doing? We're on the third floor. He's like, let me out on one. <laughs> so, and, and hold the door. So they're like, what are you doing? So Bobby goes out. He's gone for about two minutes. Comes back with a, a tray with like three half-eaten chicken wings, a half-eaten piece of pizza, half a burger. He, ba- he, just, he just went around gathering people's eaten room service trays. <laughs> and, he's, and he's like, this is the way me and Stan used to do it in Chicago. He'd take the even floors. I'd take the odd floors. <laughs> and, so, and then they go up to the room. So Bobby peels off his, his rug <laughs> chucks it on the bedpost and Kelly Chase is sitting there going this is my idol and he's eating some somebody's half day old chicken wings and his hair is sitting on the bedpost anyway that's, <laughs> no, I need, that's I need to read I need to read yeah. your book man I really do yeah yeah I think you'll like it uh, hey. where, where, who's, who's your top five prospects this year for NHL draft oh shit we just got through this one bro <laughs> I know I'm sure, you, I'm sure you've been looking ahead uh, I have not really, and uh, I'll embarrass myself if I try because I'll I'll just I'll screw up and forget names. I uh, when you have Bobby and Button on, yeah, uh, you can do that one because I'll probably get three deep and then uh, and then forget. So uh, I'm going to plead the fifth on that until oh, yeah. I can actually uh, That's fair. study it. I had Greg Owen, Button Owen on. Pa- Owen Power is my choice to go number one. So yeah, well, that's a fair. I mean, certainly he's been getting a lot of hype. Yeah, we've we've had Owen Power on the show as well. We've oh, also nice. had, and we've also had Craig Button on the show. We're basically trying to collect all the world junior teams from Canada <laughs> and the US and put out the best come the yeah. that way we that way we have like almost a stake in the world juniors or the draft. Good for you, boys. Uh, you probably do a better job analyzing the draft than I could at this standpoint. I uh <laughs> I got it. As soon as the last draft was over, I was into golf mode for a month. Now I'm just getting into world junior mode. Okay, Absolutely. I got, I got one more question. Hey, if, you, if you ask me on January 7th, I'll have a really good answer for you after I've watched these guys for two weeks in the bubble in Edmonton. <laughs> We're gonna, I got some questions regarding like upcoming stuff, world juniors and stuff. But my last question about the past here, uh, you produced the 2010 and the 2012 Olympics. Is there one of them that stands out more than the other? And, of course, Oscar Pistorius was that 2012 Olympics, and TSN just did the documentary. Did you watch that? I have not watched that doc yet. I, I definitely want to. Uh, the 2010, by far, as a matter of fact, if you had expanded that question and just asked me the highlight of my career, uh, nothing will ever top 2010. Uh, I've said that many times, and I can't imagine anything beating it. Uh, First of all, to cover an Olympics and be able to host an Olympics in your own country uh, was amazing. I love BC. Uh, the atmosphere, as you guys know, on the streets of Vancouver every night was surreal. I was lucky enough to host during the day with Lisa Laflamme and then go down and do the hockey games at night. And, uh, you know, to be there probably 40 feet away from when Crosby scored, I just don't think, uh, I don't know how anything could top that. Now, Quick story about 2012 in London. Uh, my family came over. We were going to go to France after the Olympics were over. So they, my family came over for the last week and uh, toured around London while I was working all the time. And it was really hard to get tickets. People might think you're in the business that I could get tickets to anything. No tickets. <laughs> I had to buy tickets, you know, same way anybody else would try to buy tickets. So I was able to get a track and field tickets for one day for my whole family. And uh, so I'm try- and it was the day that Pistorius was running in the, I guess the four by four, I think he was a 400 meter runner, right? Yeah. So four by four relay, four by four, four by one. I can't remember. Four uh, by one. I think it's four by one. He ran one. Yeah. He was, he was a sprinter, shot, he was right? Shot. He was like a hundred, 200 guy, right? Yeah, yeah. But he also ran by himself one time for 400. Okay. So let's say it was, I, it was probably the four by one. I, I can't remember if it was the four by four. Uh, I, somebody will correct me that watches your pod. But <laughs> um, uh, so I'm getting the kids all pumped up, telling them the whole Oscar Pistorius story. Obviously, this was before the, the other part of the Oscar Pistorius yeah. story. And I'm like, guys, you're going to get to see like the biggest story of the Olympics. This guy, unbelievable with no legs running in the Olympic Games. And 
I got them all pumped up all day. We're sitting there through all these other heats and okay, this Oscar's turn. And yeah, dad, it's Oscar. We get to see Oscar now. So what happens? The guy running right before him, they're coming around the turn. Oscar's about to get the baton <laughs> and somebody crosses into the South African runner's lane and trips him. So like literally like a few meters before Oscar is supposed to get the baton, <laughs> they're DQ'd from the race. <laughs> and my kids are sitting there going, dad, Dad, when, when's Oscar going to run? <laughs> Kids, Oscar's not running today. This is a hard lesson in life. All right? <laughs> Sometimes you don't get to see. Anyway, I was very yeah, bitter that day. They never showed that part in the documentary, that's for sure. No, no the they actually reinstated them to run in the finals, but it was too late for us because we were long gone. So that was my big Oly Olympic disappointment. Oh, okay. Hey, what was the work... Working with Luongo and all those little bits he did. Good Canuck guy. Uh, that was one of my, you know, all those bits are some of my favorite things I think I've done at TSN. Uh, it's funny. I, I, I didn't know Roberto at all. Um, I'd interview, you know, I'd been in some scrums, maybe interviewed him, but didn't know him at all. And back in, when he was in Florida and, and Noodles, Jamie McLennan was his backup. My boss asked me to do a, a story about backup goalies. And they wanted a serious story about what it's like to be a backup goalie when you're only playing 10, 12 games a year back in the day when that's all they did if you were behind a big starter. So I kind of have a warped sense of humor. And uh, so I, I instead dreamt about doing, I knew Noodles, Noodles was a character. I said, why don't we do a story about the backup goalie being really jealous of the starting goalie and wanting to get rid of him. And so that's where we did that scene where noodles try, runs him over with the Zamboni and yep. the very, so the very first time I met Roberto, we were filming that scene at the end of practice. It was the la first scene we were going to film. So uh, I'm, he's coming off the ice and I'm standing there and I go, Hey Roberto, it's James from TSN. Really nice to meet you. So uh, I don't know if noodles told you about this, but we're going to run you over with the Zamboni now and, and that was our first conversation and he was so good about it and he started coming up with ideas for the piece why don't we do this scene why don't we do this scene and so I, I i quickly sort of understood that he had the same warped sense of humor that i did and uh then he you know we did a sequel to that and then we did another one and then he started calling me with his own ideas and uh i don't know which is my favorite i think that two of them the one we did when him and schneider were battling to be the starter yeah, uh, that's one of my favorites simply because that was such a you guys know how intense a story that was in, oh, in yeah. Vancouver. Yeah. And you think of two guys, you know, competing that hard and to see them, you know, having so much fun with it, I think was I think that was one of my favorites. The other one was the last story I think we did with him was called the panel intern when he shows up at uh, TSN to be an intern and uh, noodles is now working for us and being a real jerk and uh roberto ends up slamming him with a camera but <laughs> i think that's my favorite because it's just the purely stupidest one we did they're all really stupid but that one might be the pure stupidest one we did so they're, they're uh, good for some laughs yeah they're like i said they're just uh and another one we did we did luongo poetry where we wrote all these poems and we dressed them up in a cap i don't know if you guys remember that yeah, one Yeah, i've seen that uh, one yeah. yeah so i had a lot of fun with him uh, over the years and uh, like I said he shares he wrote actually uh, if you do get the book he's the, the forward of the book is the story of uh, of that night that uh, basically he was crapping his pants and missed yep. the first four minutes of overtime no yeah, that's we the remember. forward of the book and then uh, one of the last chapters of the book is uh, sort of his story of the 2010 Olympics I, I didn't want Sid to write it because I thought that had been written too much so I wanted really the inside story from Roberto and he tells the full story about when he, you know, when Babcock first told him he was going to be the starter or you replacing Brodeur and how he was sick to his stomach and saw all the inside stuff about what that, uh, what that tournament was like before they won the gold. What was it like uh, playing in the movie, the goon? Um, did you get to see or talk to uh, Sean William Scott much or Eugene Levy? <laughs> Not Eugene Levy though. He, he, uh, Eugene Levy's not in that one goon, too, I don't think. No. I thought he what was. Thinking of? Uh, oh, me. I might I, be wrong on that. So, oh, that's, all right. that's okay, bro. You just got fact-checked. Um, 
<laughs> Nothing fact-checked. Again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I met, uh, so I, the scene that we did, like we're in, it's funny, we did, I did that movie with TJ Miller. He plays my analyst. And uh, we shot it all at TSN in one day in like four hours. So I never got to meet any of the cast. Jay Baruchel would be the own lone exception who's a bit of a friend of mine. And so he was the one who uh, put me in the movie, was kind enough to do that. And so I just thought, honestly, that we'd be one scene in the movie, like one line or something. And then we go to the screening of the movie and we're in the whole movie. Like basically every line we filmed at TSN that day is in the movie, which kind of freaked me out. Uh, but I did get to meet Sean William Scott uh, at the at the party for the movie. They had a party after the premiere of the movie in Toronto, and so I got to meet all those guys. Did not meet uh, shit. Liv Ray Donovan. Okay. Uh, I never never know if it's Liv or Liev Liev Schreiber Liev oh. Liv yeah. Liev. Something. Um, I didn't get to meet him. He never showed up, but. Uh, uh, anyway, it was. Uh, it's always cool being in a movie. I suppose Jay was awesome about it. So uh, I made, let's see, seven hundred and sixty-eight dollars. I think for my role in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's uh, let's get to the World Juniors now. Um, who do you think captains this year's World Juniors? Because you guys already put out your preview show. <laughs> uh Gosh, they got so many guys back. So it's got to be one of the returning players. Kirby Doc. Kirby Doc is probably going to be the guy. Because um, it's usually going to be a 19-year-old, too. I'd say it would be I great think- for somebody like Byfield, but uh, I, Kirby Doc makes the most sense, I would say. Or one of the D. If Drysdale's back. I think Byram gets an A, possibly. Yeah, that would make sense. Hey, what do you think it would take? That's one of my questions. What do you think it would take to get Byram out of Colorado for the Canucks? That was my <laughs> – you're, you're not, you're not going to play those fantasy deals, are you? I don't know. We just love Byram must too and most of Vancouver, so it broke our hearts when Colorado got him and the Canucks didn't move up to get him. Instead, the Canucks took Pod Colson, and how do you think he looks? Uh, again uh, – just from my world junior experience, I yeah. thought he looked awesome. But yeah. uh, I, you know, I'm not one who sits and watches uh, tons of, you know, junior tape or tape from overseas. So I pretty much rely wholeheartedly on what I see with my eyes during the world juniors. <laughs> so that's, that's, I let Button do most of the scouting. I mean, I watch a lot of junior hockey when I can during seasons, but uh, uh, you know, for most of those guys, you know, the Tim Stutzlas of the world uh, and uh, most of the Russians, I only get them at the World Juniors. But he, What's, I think he's, he's really good. But I know yeah, I think he's, you, can't, you, can't, you can't play that game of, oh, but we could have had Byram or whatever. If you play that game of the Canucks could have had this guy, there's always going to be three or four guys that are going to turn you'll out. You'll let me in Kachuk. We could have had Yeah, Kachuk. but think of what, okay, but think of, okay, what if you hadn't taken Patterson? What was he? What was he, 10? No, like, then they got Pedersen like five or six. Five. five. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm terrible with my draft numbers. Yeah. Five? five? Yeah, okay. five So Pedersen was five. And uh, what was he, seven? Six. six? Seven. Six? I don't know. Okay, okay. so <laughs> – but, like, if you – you know, you could have easily passed on one of those guys. They didn't. So I, I think Canucks got a pretty good track record for – you know, when you have two superstars on your team that you got at, okay, if it's five and six or five and seven or whatever it is there, you're, uh, you're laughing. What's been your uh, go-to quarantine snack? <laughs> Man, these questions are all over the map, boys. I love it. Uh, I tell you, I did not eat healthy at the Masters. My go-to, <laughs> they had this uh, peanut butter kind of, not pretzels, but the kind of pretzely pretzely uh feel to them i don't know what they're called they're, but they're kind of shaped like little squares and they, they taste like pretzel but they have a peanut butter infusion oh yeah inside those things them. are killer those things are good yeah they come in like those big jars <laughs> big tubs yeah <laughs> oh yeah we were just massacring those things throughout the week so uh yeah besides my wife eats pretty healthy so when i'm in my house i do okay but when i'm on the road it's just an epic disaster do you think next season's up, NHL season's up in jeopardy with no fans? 
I think they'll find a way, uh, only because I was a, one of the doubters who didn't think they'd get the playoffs in, and they found a way to do that. Now, obviously, this is more challenging because you can't just stick everybody in a bubble for six months. Yeah, I think that – I personally think that a full season is too ambitious and that I know financially they need as many games as possible with fans in the stands, but – if you are not going to have fan, and I know the TV deals are obviously matter as well, but more realistically, a season kind of like the lockout season in what was it, thirteen, fifteen? I, I'm terrible yeah. with my years. Half season. where they what are the yeah play fifty? I, and I also I'm not much into like playing into July. I know they had to do it this year, but I would really love to see the cup handed out at least by the end of June. And so we can get back to some sort of, you know, have summer off and get back to normal next year. Hopefully the vaccine is, is out and uh, there's enough immunity that there's normalcy by the fall. Uh, so realistically, I would think that that makes a lot more sense to have, say, a 50-game season, hopefully have some fans in the building, uh, if not at the beginning, a month or two in, and maybe by if there is a vaccine that's widely available by March or April that perhaps by the second half of that season or by the playoffs anyway, you could have, if not full buildings, 10, 12,000 fans yeah. in the building, which I think would help. To me, that's a more realistic goal. Uh, but I, I understand all the financial uh, concerns that the league has. There's billions of dollars on the line. So I understand why they want to maximize and the amount of games. But. Uh, as a Canucks season ticket holder, where they're taking money out of my account every week or every month, um, I sure as hell hope I get to go to some games next year. But I also don't want it to be where I only see the same Canadian division, right? They got that Canadian division going to happen where it's, you see the only the same teams. Every I think game. it'll be really cool for a while. And it'll be cool because, you know, the six top ones are, are so competitive. And even the Sens are not going to be an easy out, I don't think, on any night. But I, I agree with you that, I think it'll be really cool for a couple of months and then it's going to get old and you're going to want to see, you want to see everybody else. Who's on your hoodie, by the way, I can only see the top half of it. Oh, this is my, our logo for the podcast. It's on oh, my wall. Awesome. It's on my wall. Oh, too. Okay. Okay. That's awesome. The, um, who do you think is the best Canadian team in that Canadian division on the you spot see, here? Uh, Bob McKenzie taught me long ago that the way you answer these questions is you do the, <laughs> When you do the Vancouver podcast, you say the Canucks. <laughs> and then when you do the guy that has the Calgary podcast, you do the Flames, and you just hope there's no crossover listeners. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, tr truthfully, uh, I think I answered this question on a national radio show and said Van. And I'm not saying that to suck up to your market. And, and it wasn't by a large margin. I, I really think you can make a case for – you could probably make a case for any of the six. You could make a definitive argument for it. But – I'll just I'll admit to recency bias. The one team that I saw go the furthest this year was Vancouver. And I saw their core guys all play off the charts good for the most part. And I know you guys were probably pissed at who you lost. And I know the goaltending, you know, Markstrom in particular hurts. I think Nate Schmidt probably saved the off season for the Canucks. Big fan of him as a player. Yeah. Um, but I, I truly believe that I haven't seen like, okay, if I was to make the Toronto argument, I would say, yeah, that they got unbelievable players, but I haven't seen them do anything in the playoffs. And I've seen Bo Horvat and uh, Elias Patterson and, and Quinn Hughes be awesome in the playoffs. And, you know, Calgary did a little bit this year, but there's oh, still a lot of team. questions. Their goaltending is going to be better and they've added some nice pieces, but I haven't seen them do a ton. And you know, Winnipeg's got a ton of talent, but no defense. You know, holes on D, and so you can. And Montreal's everybody's sort of trendy picking Montreal as the most improved team, particularly in Canada. But again, I haven't seen it right. But so I don't know how you, you can only go on what you've seen. I don't know how Montreal's called the most improved team. They trade away Max Domi, but they, you, uh, for the Canuck fans, we're mostly pissed. I could. I was happy about – not happy, but not angry about Markstrom wa get, walking away, losing Tan. If The one that hurts the most is you give up a prospect like Tyler Madden for Toffoli, and then you let Toffoli walk away on a contract that they could have had. But Yeah, I didn't understand that. And uh, uh, 
he seemed like a good fit. It's not often, so often you get a guy and it doesn't fit. And when you get a guy and it's a fit and he produces and he produces in the playoffs, that part of it doesn't make sense to me unless there was something going on behind the scenes that I don't know about. And uh, so that's a hole that, you know, I thought maybe they'd make a harder run at Hoffman or, you know, just to fill, to fill that gap that they, you know, a scoring winger like that that you could really use. Yeah, we don't want but, Hoff- uh, we don't we don't want Hoffman. His his wife's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> hey hey James, uh, if you could put in a good word with us with uh, Bob, that'd be great. We'd love to have him on. Well, if if you're, I'll tell you this right now. If you're gonna get Bob, you got to get Bob now because when Bob's doing the book thing, he's got his own book out. Yeah. Uh, Buy Bob's book, but only after you've bought and uh, purchased beauties. Uh, <laughs> once Bob's done the book tour, Bob will be disappearing into the world. <laughs> yeah, he's so uh, he's retired. So maybe you can put in a good. It's word only se- only se- only semi retirement. You'll still see him at the World Juniors and stuff. But uh, if you're gonna get, it, I'll uh, I'll uh, when I uh, tweet out your pot or whatever, uh, I'll make sure uh, I give Bob a heads up. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much. Nice. Appreciate it. But you yeah, can't I, control – I have no influence over Bob. Bob is his own man. I, no, hey, <laughs> if, you, if you could help with somebody, then, if it, if it isn't Bob, how about your actor buddy from The Goon? I love that guy. <laughs> I'll get Liev Schreiber for you. There you go. Yeah, I, I meant the other guy, but yeah. <laughs> hey, James, uh, thank you so much uh, for taking the time for us today and coming on. We really appreciate it, and we've been big fans of yours for a long time, and it's great to just be able to chat with you. Mike Ryan, uh, my pleasure, man. Thanks. Uh, always good to talk to you, two good BC boys. Uh-